Let's go from current slide. And I may even turn on the today. I'm still taking that. Okay. Uh, let me cover just a couple of, well, yeah, maybe a couple of announcements. I can't remember if I told this class this or not. Uh, it seemed like I probably didn't, but just to let you know. Normally on Fridays, I have office hours in the Birmingham West Campus from 8 till noon, okay? Not tomorrow. <laughs> Definitely not tomorrow. I just found out last Friday that I've been assigned to go down to Opelika to participate in a statewide curriculum review committee. So, Opelika is a long way away, and the meeting starts at 9 down there. So we're going to have to leave the Birmingham West Campus at 6. So if you don't, if you want to see me tomorrow morning, I'll be on the Birmingham campus a little before 6, and then we'll be leaving at 6. So that's your window of opportunity. <laughs> be a little before 6 until 6. I will not be on campus from 8 to noon because I'll be still We'll still be on the way to uh, Opelika at 8, and we'll be in the meetings at noon. The meetings go until 2, and then we'll turn around and come home. And that's another approximately three-hour drive, especially during, since we're coming into Birmingham at rush hour. So I probably won't be back on the Birmingham West Campus until somewhere around 5, maybe a little on the front end of 5 or maybe on the back end. So that's the only other opportunity you have to catch me tomorrow is around 5 -ish. okay? So a little before 6 or around 5 -ish, sometime around there. That's the only time I'll be on the Birmingham West Campus tomorrow. Now, secondly, normally I'm supposed to work four hours on Fridays. Tomorrow, basically I'm working 11 hours, okay? 6 until 5. Okay, not working, but you know, traveling with your school business. Okay, so I'm going to try to take off the following Friday as well to make up at least part of those other uh, seven hours that I, I'm doing tomorrow that I'm not supposed to. I don't know if I'll be able to or not, but I have some things I have to take care of, and I won't be able to tomorrow afternoon, which I normally am able to take care of things on Friday afternoon because I get off at noon. Not going to be able to take care of things tomorrow afternoon. Now, in addition to that, and this has nothing to do with taking off next Friday, I hope it won't anyway, but last night, right around a little before 10 o'clock, I was sitting in our den. My wife had already gone up to go to bed. The dog was out, which is good. I was going to let her in shortly. And I heard a terrible crash. And I thought, oh no, some car on the slick road either hit another car or hit something. It was, it was bad. So I started putting my, shutting down my computer so I could get up and go see what it was about. About that time, in came the dog. She had pushed the door open. She raced in the house. She had heard the crash too. So I got on my jacket and went outside and an enormous oak tree that we I'm guessing is around, was 125 years old. It was so big that if I wrapped my arms as tight as I could around the tree, I couldn't get halfway around the tree. Okay? So it had to have been between 12 and 15 feet girth around the tree. And it was right at the edge of our driveway, mostly on our property. But probably it was so big, probably a little bit on the neighbor's property too. But it had, I mean, there was hardly any wind at all. There was no rain. It was just very still night. It had just fallen under. But all the rain we'd been having had the soil so wet, so saturated, it wasn't holding the tree down. And the tree, I guess, had been just slowly, slowly, leaning until it got top heavy and crashed. Almost totally in my our neighbor's yard. 
nothing really in our yard. Where it came up, it disrupted the driveway, the paved driveway. It had been disrupting that some, but it disrupted a little bit, kicked up some things there. Uh, but all the trees and the limbs and everything else were either in our neighbor's yard or in the street. Okay, so we were all out there, a gawk at it, and finally. Well, I got to go call the police because it's, I, I didn't realize it was in the street as badly until I got up there to see it. I said, I better go call the police because they need to get somebody here to stop people from coming around that curve and just plowing into it. Because there was a street light at an intersection, but we were in the dark, you know, and no one would be able to see it. So I went in to call the police, went to the phone book. The phone book only listed the jail. That was the only thing they listed for the police. They didn't list any of the precinct stations. So I called the jail. I said, I know I don't need you, but I need Southside Precinct. He said, and they had to ask around to find it, and they got it and gave it to me. So then I called them, and he said, well, and I explained what it was. He said, well, this is an emergency. You need to call the non-emergency number. I said, well, this is the number I was given. Well, you need to call the non-emergency number. I said, well, it's blocking the street. You need to call the non-emergency. Okay, give me the non-emergency number. So I gave, they gave it to me. I called that one. Oh, uh, okay, the trees in the street. Yeah, and I explained everything like two or three times. Started off, my name, my address, where we were, blah, blah, blah. And then when they finally got the idea that the tree was actually in the street, well, what's your name? What's your address? All right, well, we'll have somebody out there. So I went on out there, and just about the time I got to the street, here came a car barreling around the bend, you know, hit limbs and things like crazy uh, in the street, and I uh, said, this tree just fell over. I said, uh, I was inside calling police or I would have been out here sooner. Uh, they're supposed to come sometime. So he managed to back up and pull out go on and the car came up behind him but saw him and then so I stood out under the street light uh, at the intersection and you know, anytime I saw a car coming waved they were going to just speed past me I think they thought I was homeless or something and wanting to bum some money I don't know uh, but they just were, I said there's a tree down there's a tree down and they would then slow a little bit and then slam on brakes and then back up and say thank you yeah, but they were going to ignore me completely the first. And I was out there doing that for, it had to have been 30 to 45 minutes. It may have actually been longer before the police finally showed up. And then they went to the other side. I kept waiting, you need to be here, you know. So finally he came and parked his cruiser there with the light flashing. So that took care of that. But then we had to do all the reports and get all the information to him. <laughs> he was real funny, he said. It's the biggest street I've ever seen in my life. You know, this is like from a movie or something. <laughs> I said, yeah, a horror movie. Isn't it? And uh, the neighbor was out there. Uh, it was all over her yard. And one of the limbs had come down across the left rear back panel of her car. So we knew there was some damage there. Probably the bumper. And this morning we saw the other uh, bumper probably had to say And her hatchback probably wasn't all over them. So probably going to be fairly significant damage there. So once you know, we got all the questions answered and stuff like that, I went in to call our insurance company just to see what we're supposed to do because I figured. So I guess the night crew is the least experienced crew. <laughs> okay, they were. So finally found the number. I thought I had the card in my wallet, but I must have taken it out for some reason. So. My wife found the number, so I called it and went through a menu and said, what do you want? I said, homeowner's policies. Okay, homeowner's policies, so they connect me to somebody. And uh, they were asking if I wanted to start a homeowner's policy. 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. No, I wanted to report an issue. Oh, oh, okay. And I started telling her, she said, oh, I'm sorry, you need claims. We do the policies, but you need the claims. Well, can you connect me to the claims? Oh, yes, I'll be glad to. So the claims guy came in. 
I explained everything again. He said, I'm going to have to do some research on this. Can you hold? So he was gone for quite a while. Finally came back and said, uh, well, I see you do have homeowners. I said, yeah, that's who I called first, and they directed me to your claims. He said, well, yeah, but I'm auto claims. I'm not homeowners claims. <laughs> that's why I said it must have been the rookie crew. And I said, well, why would she direct me to you? Well, maybe nobody's here for homeowners claim tonight. You know, by now it's well after 11. And uh, he said, let me find out, and if I can find somebody, I'll give them all the information you've given me so you don't have to go through it all again because I've already been through it two or three times with the police, two or three times with the insurance. So finally, finally, and it took him so long I figured he must have gotten somebody. So he came back on and, uh, and said, I got somebody else on the line from homeowners claim. So he came on and he then had to still ask a lot of things for a bunch of things because he wasn't. So that took a while and so finally, Said, I said, well, what do we do? I mean, well, if you have to have anything done, get out of your driveway. Or I said, no, no, the tree's not in our driveway. It's in the neighbor's driveway. It's on the neighbor's car. It's not on our car. Oh, well, then don't do anything. I said, well, are we responsible for helping her get to work tomorrow? She can't drive. She can't get out of her driveway even if the car was in good shape. No, no, don't do a thing. Wait until the adjusters. Can't do a thing until the adjuster. If you needed something to be done in your yard, yeah, keep receipts and we'll reimburse you, you know, or whatever. But no, that's on her. Oh, <laughs> and sure enough, they said, when Karen came in and read some of the policy and stuff, he said, it looks like, and actually the guy when I was talking about it, he said, he kept sort of hemming on, I said, so you mean an act of God type thing? He said, yeah, exactly. Probably I should have said an act of nature. It just fell, you know. And it's not my fault, even though the tree was mostly on my property, but it fell on her property. It's her insurance has to cover it. Iris probably is not going to help it again. So <laughs> it was a long night. Uh, it probably... I know it was close to midnight before I finally got, oh, oh, and the police, he was calling in all the people he needed to call in, and uh, he ultimately called whoever the crew is that's supposed to come out and clear the road. And I was already in calling police, when my wife, I mean calling insurance, when my wife came in, and she said, he said it's going to be probably a couple hours before they get here. <laughs> so just about the time, I got to bed pretty close to, if not at midnight, just settling in, trying to fall asleep. So the adrenaline was sort of flowing. They got there with the chainsaws and the truck. And like, <laughs> so I fell asleep before they finished because I don't remember them leaving, but Karen stayed up and watched it all. And uh, so it was a long night. <laughs> it was a long night. And then this morning, uh, had to report to our neighbor what our insurance company had said, which I'm sure she wasn't too happy with. And we get along well with our neighbor, but her husband's a lawyer. So I hope that doesn't mean anything bad, because I'm pretty sure our insurance, just based on what the guy wouldn't say last night, I have a feeling I don't do a thing, unless we had... The, well, she said this morning, because she was out there again taking pictures and stuff, because at night you couldn't get in any pictures. Uh, and it was raining, of course. So uh, she said, uh, you'll probably get a new driveway out of it. I hadn't even thought of that. I thought that might be a repair, but she said, oh, you'll get a new driveway. I said, maybe. I bet you our deductible will get a new driveway. I don't think the insurance will cut me a pay I said, well, when I talked to my insurance, I said I had a rookie crew, it sounded like, that probably had the U.S. people doing the night shift, and basically always said that you can't do a thing until we hear from your adjusters. So I told them again, you need to talk to your insurance people, I'll go out of mine, let's let the insurance people get to there. She said, and then we'll, we'll figure it out from there. I said, yeah. So I don't know. Anyway, that's taking up trig time. 
but no refund. Okay. All right. Any questions on trig or anything else before we get going? All right. We're in Chapter 4, Trigonometry. I took 15 minutes to do that. I'm sorry. That was way too long. We're just now, if my memory's right, starting 4.7. Is that where y'all had us? Okay. Inverse trigonometric functions. Okay. Our objectives here are to evaluate and graph the inverse sine function, and then we'll evaluate and graph the other inverse trigonometric function. And when it says other, Thank goodness they don't mean cosecant and secant. Those are a pain in the neck to graph. Uh, and probably and not bad to evaluate necessarily, but they're a pain in the neck to graph. So when it says others, that means cosine and tangent. And maybe cotangent. Okay? But they, they don't need to be messed with the secant and cosecant. And we'll evaluate the composition of trigonometric functions. Okay? which always comes along with inverse functions. Okay. So let's start. And by the way, I have a sore throat now, so that's why there's a cough drop in my mouth. So if I sound like I'm eating rocks, that's why. Okay. We'll start with the inverse sine function. Now I want to ask you, if you remember from pre-calculus algebra, What's a requirement for a function to have an inverse function? Remember the requirements? Okay. What's the requirement for a function to be a function? Remember? Say again. Okay, and input and output for sure. And there's a certain relationship to for every input there is one and only one output. But remember, you can have two inputs giving the same output, but you can't have one input getting two or more outputs, right? And what verified that was the vertical line test, right? Okay. Now. If a function has an inverse function, the inverse of that function also has to be a function. Means, same thing you said before for any input, only one output. But remember the inverse functions? The input of this one is the output of that one, and vice versa. Right? You exchange the x's and y's. That's what the inverse means. Right? Well, if you exchange the x's and y's, if this one and this one can't have, uh, if this one can't have more than one output for any input, this one can't have more than one output for any input. So that means not only is it a vertical line test required, horizontal line test also must be met. The other way of saying that, to be, for a function to have an inverse, it has to be, remember that? One to one functions, exactly. That's a simple form, okay. One to one function, okay. Meaning for every input, there's only one output, and for every output, there's only one input. One to one, okay. What that means effectively, a function cannot back up on itself because that fails the horizontal line test. So that means a function has either has to be strictly increasing or strictly decreasing. No exceptions. Now, think about how the graph of a sine function is. Whoa! Fails the vertical a horizontal line test miserably. So to have an inverse sine function, we have to limit the domain of that sine function to where it's either strictly increasing or strictly decreasing. We're going to choose increasing, and I think you'll see why. We know that 
for a function to have an inverse function, it has to be one to one, just like y'all said. That means it has to pass the horizontal line test, just like you said. And from this figure, you can see the sine function, the sine function, the sine function fails the horizontal line test miserably unless you restrict the domain for where it's strictly increasing or strictly decreasing. And since this is around the origin, we're going to use this one right here, where it's strictly increasing. That's the only part of the sine function that, is, that has an inverse. By our definition, that's the part that has an inverse. Okay? It has an inverse on this interval, from minus pi halves to pi halves, because they're strictly increased. That's the minimum here, goes through this, zero, and has a maximum value. Can't go any further this way or any this way because then it fails to be one to one. Okay? So that's the only reason over which it has an inverse. So it's input, domain, negative pi halves to pi halves, it's output, negative one to one. So when you do the inverse, then the input for the inverse will be negative one to one, and the output for the inverse will be negative pi halves. So you flip the x's and the y's. Does that make sense? Okay. So, however, when you restrict the domain to the interval, negative pi halves less than or equal to x less than or equal to pi halves, corresponding to the black portion on that that we just showed, the following properties hold. On that interval, the function y is strictly increasing. Remember, that was another requirement. To be one to one, it had to be strictly increasing or decreasing. This is increasing. On this interval from negative pi halves to pi halves, y equals sine x takes on its full range of values from negative one to positive one. So we didn't want to say, well, we just want to take this. It's one to one from here to here. No, we want to take on its full range of values so we make the interval as big as we can, but no bigger than it, than it can be. Okay, so it takes on its full range of value, values, negative one to one, and on that interval, negative pi halves to pi halves, sine of x is one to one, which basically is strictly increasing, it has to be one to one. Okay, so those are the three criteria we have to meet. So on that restricted domain, from negative pi halves to pi halves, including the endpoints, Sine y is equal to sine x has a unique inverse function, and that's called the inverse sine function. And here's how we denote it. Now, a regular function was f of x, we call it f superscript to minus 1, that means inverse function. Normally, a superscript on a number like 7 to the minus 1 would mean 1 over 7. Or on a variable, x to the minus 1 means 1 over x. Doesn't mean that for a function. If you have f to the minus 1, that means inverse function. It doesn't mean reciprocal function. Does not. Okay? So we can use that same notation here, except your inverse, your function now, is not f of x, but it's sine of x. So we can put sine to the minus 1. That doesn't mean 1 over sine. That means the inverse of sine. But from ancient. <laughs> not ancient, but from way back, another name for this is arc sine. Okay? And the book seems to like arc sine better than inverse sine, because they use it way more frequently. I prefer inverse sine, because it's easier to write, and it's just like the other function set. But the book likes arc sine. It's perfectly fine. Now, here's one of the reasons that they do use and this is something I find very helpful in doing inverse functions of your trig functions. Let's think about the function itself. Y is equal to sine x. Now the book doesn't use these terminology. I use these terminology because this is how I like to think about it. The book likes to say you take the trig functions of real numbers. Well, of course. You know, that's what you usually use with your argument, is a real number. So that doesn't say anything to me. But when I think of trig, 
I think that this is my angle, and that's my value of the sine for that angle. So I think of this as an angle, which is a real number, and radius is just a real number. But I think of that as an angle, and this is the value associated with that angle. Right? So when you reverse them, then this becomes the angle, and that becomes the value for the angle. Because you exchange your x and the y, and the y and the x. So that's how I like like to think about them. That way I keep in my mind right which goes inside, which goes outside. The angle here is next to the sign, here is away from the sign, on the other side of the angle. The book doesn't say that, that's how I think. Now, because of that, this is where that term arc sign comes from, comes from, kinda, okay? It still doesn't make perfect sense. It comes from the association of a central angle with its intercepted arc length on the unit circle. And if you remember, that's what a radian is defined as, is the ratio between the arc length and the radius. Okay? So this is now the relationship between the central angle and the arc length. Okay? So arc sine, arc length, that's somehow a high way to get there. How I like to think of it, this is the angle, that's the value. This is the angle, that's the value. Okay? So arc sine means the angle, the angle whose arc is sine, uh, the angle or the arc whose sine is x. Okay? And that's exactly what I'm trying to say. The angle is what you're looking for here, given the value here. The sine of that angle is that x. Okay. Both notations, arc sine and inverse sine, are commonly used in mathematics. So remember that inverse sine of x denotes the inverse of the sine function, not 1 over sine. What's 1 over sine? Trig identity. What's 1 over sine? This is a quiz from your 113 class. What's 1 over sine? This is 113 class. Okay? Okay. What did we just have? What is 1 over sine? Cosecant. So we don't need this to be that. 1 over sine is cosecant. This means inverse sine. Okay. So the values of the arc sine, like I said, they like it. Remember, these are the angles. That's why there's the pi halves and minus pi halves. This is the value, the number between minus 1 and 1, okay? So that's how I have to number it. When I see arc sine of x, I think, what is the angle whose sine of that angle, I even like to call it theta, because that reminds me it's an angle, has the value of x, okay? That's what it means. So the graph of y is equal to arc sine of x is shown here. Again, you flip the input and the output. Before, on the sine, you went from minus pi halves to pi, pi halves on the x, and you went from minus 1 to 1 on the y. You flip those and go from minus 1 to 1 on the x, and from minus pi halves to pi halves on the y. Okay, so that's one thing you can say. Now, here's the other way I like Think of it. I'm going to try to draw on this map, on this thing, but I never do a very good job, so forgive me. Uh, but let me get my pen set up. Okay. It would be something like this. That's how that portion of your sine function looks. Okay? Now think of it this way. It's sort of flat here, goes to one to one here, and then flattens out here. So where it's flat here and here, one to one here, when you do the inverse sine, rather than being flat here, it's going infinite here on the slope. And infinite here on the slope, but still pretty close to one to one. 
So this, the sine function is flat to flat, one to one in between. This one's infinite to infinite with one to one in between. So they sort of diverge like that. But that's exactly what your inverse functions do. They reflect across the line that we call the one to one line. The y is equal to x, the identity function. And sure enough, there's reflection across it. And right in the middle, they're always on top of each other. Because they're right there. Okay. So they didn't draw that in. I thought I would. That helps me to remember how to draw this one. Okay. Okay. So here's the definition, the formal definition of the inverse sine function. The inverse sine function is denoted either by y is equal to arc sine x or y is equal to inverse sine of x. And that's true if and only if sine of y is equal to x. And again, it goes back to that's the angle, that's the value. That's the angle, that's the value. Okay? And when I see something like this, if I'm given this, I think that, okay? Because I'm used to thinking that, and that helps me see this. Where now, the x is going from 1 to 1, because the negative 1 to 1, because that's where that x goes. And the y is going from negative 5 halves to 5 halves, because that's where that y goes, okay? So it has to be that way. The domain of y is equal to arc cosine x, the x value, is one to one, negative one to one, including the endpoints, and the range is negative five halves to five halves, including the endpoints. I'm making a special point of including endpoints because of something that's going to come up later. Okay. So, here we have, if possible, find the exact value of arc sine of negative one half. Okay? Now, what did I say I usually think when I see something like that? Usually, what I'm going to do is give it, make this my variable. Now, what variable do you think you want to use? Okay, that's everybody's favorite, except not mine in this case. Because remember, what does this represent? This represents an angle. So I like to use theta to remind myself that's an angle, not a value. It is a value, but, you know, it's an angle value. And as soon as I write that down, then I want to change that equation, write an equivalent equation. What would that be? And a hint, not going to use arc. Not y. Negative one half equals sine of theta. You got it. That's it. The equivalent equation to this. Once I put in a value, not value, a variable in here, and I like to use a Greek letter to remind myself that it's an angle we're talking about here. Then I say sine of that angle theta is equal to whatever is in my argument. I flip it around because I'm used to doing this. I'm not used to thinking that way. Okay? Now, you don't have to do it this way, but this helps me. Now, I ask myself, what angle theta has a sine of one half, negative one half? What if I said what angle theta has a sine of one half? What angle theta would that be? Mmm, 4.2, 4.3, 4.4, maybe not 4, but somewhere in there. We did them over and over and over again. That's one of our favorites, especially if it's one half. What angle would have that as a sign? Now, 45 is root 2 over 2. This is 1 over 2. Say again? Okay. You're off in another quadrant somewhere. Remember, we're going to be between 
minus pi halves and pi halves. Or if you prefer, minus 90 to 90. So don't go over to the 120. That's completely outside of where we're thinking. Okay, think first quadrant. What angle theta has a sine of one half? That should be on your thing there if you're looking at a, your circle. Get ready to kick yourself. I hope you're willing to kick yourself to not Pi over three. Say again? Pi over three. Okay, that's cosine. Pi six. Say again? Pi six, you got it. So the angle theta would be, now that would be for the positive one half. So what would it be if that was negative one half? Negative pi six. But remember your range of an inverse sign is between negative pi half and pi half. So this is over here is negative pi six. Okay? Maybe you don't like the way I approach it, and that's perfectly legitimate. But I kind of don't like the way the book approaches it, and I'll show you that in a minute. Let's do the next one. Okay, inverse sine of root 3 over 2, what would be you think I would do first? Yeah, sine it sum. What's the answer to that going to be? Inverse, arc, same thing. It's going to be an angle. And what do you want to call that angle? Second? They, I love theta. Okay, one of my favorite angles of all time. Now I want to rewrite that equation using the angle theta, but not using an inverse. What would that be? Okay, square root of 3 over 2 is equal to sine of theta. Perfect. Now, what angle theta has a sine of root 3 over 2? No, that's what this one. It's what? Did someone mumble something? Huh? Pi thirds, that's why I was pointing at you. So the theta is equal to pi thirds. Okay, I'm going to do these again just because it seems like you may have forgotten them. Here are one of our favorite angles. Zero, pi thirds, I mean pi six, it got me doing it now. Pi fourths, pi thirds, and pi halves. Okay, or you could put 30, 45, 60, 90, okay? However you want to think of them, okay? Now, the signs of these, um, the square root of 0 over 2, the square root of 1 over, over 2, that's a 2, that's ugly, 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 okay? The square root of 2 over 2, the square root of 3 over 2, and the square root of 4 over 2. That's what the signs of those angles are. And this, of course, is 0, right? 30, 0, 0. 30, 1, 1. So that's 1 half. Okay? This is square root of 2 over 2, which we were guessing before. That's the pi fourth. Square root of 3 over 2, that's the pi thirds. Square root of 4 is 2 over 2 is 1. So, and, um, I have the sign of 1. Okay? And then you can go down this way. Since this is our range here, from minus pi halves, see before we weren't doing the negative angles that much, minus pi halves, that would be 1 again. The sign would be 1. This would be negative root 3 over 2. This would be negative root 2 over 2, and this would be negative 1 half. Just negative, going down. Same angles, this is negative pi 6, 
negative pi fourths, negative pi thirds, and negative, well, I've written negative pi halves. Okay. That's the easy way to remember the signs. Root 0 over 2, root 1 over 2, root 2 over 2, root 3 over 2, and root 4 over 2. Okay. Let's erase most of that. You got it? Can I erase? Okay. The reason I said about trig class, my Cal 1 class is almost the same size, and uh, anytime they hit a trig question, they don't know. I said, I got to talk with your trig instructor. I was about to say that to you, and I realized I am your trig instructor. Okay, never mind. All right. How about the next one? Inverse sine of 2. What would you do first? Okay, and what variable you want for it? Ah, uh, I like theta 2. Okay, now I want to rewrite it. How would I rewrite that? 2 is equal to sine of theta. Perfect. Now, what angle theta gives you a sine of 2? Okay. This time I'm going to draw a sine curve. Okay. I'll do pi half, blah, 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 and blah, blah, and blah, blah. Okay, this will be 1, 2, negative 1, negative 2. This will be pi halves, pi, 2 pi, negative pi halves, negative pi, negative 2 pi, and so on and so on and so on. Where does sign begin? At 0 and goes up to? 1 at pi halves, down to 0, down to negative 1, whoop, negative 1 at pi halves, up to 0, and on and on and on. This one goes this way, that way, this way, that way, this way, on and on and on. What value of theta is assigned to? You're right. Shake that hat. There is none. Never gets to two. Ever. Okay? It stays between minus one and one. Remember? So this has, remember it said if, if possible, not possible. Or no solution. Or however you want to say it. There is no angle theta who gives you a sign of two. Because sine is always between minus one and one. In your calculator, I've got a seat. No! Thank you. No! If you tried to post, put that in your calculator, you're probably going to get just something that says E or error, or it's going to say domain error, meaning it's not in there. It can't be in there. Okay. So, Let's see how they did it. Can I erase? Okay. So for the A one, now here's how they did it. They say, because this is true, that's your answer. And to me, that's a little less than satisfying. I like to say, well, let's just set that to be that you could use x if you wanted to, but since you know it's got to be an angle, let that be what you're looking for. That's what we usually do. Whatever you're looking for, let the variable be that, right? So in this case, I would choose because I know it has to be an angle because the arc sign operates on the number to give you an angle, so let that be an angle. But they say, because this is true, that's your answer. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, right, but that's not very satisfying. I like it better to say 
Let that be your unknown. And I like to choose a theta or alpha or something else that reminds me it's got to be an angle. And then I rewrite the equation to say sine of theta or alpha or whatever is equal to negative one half. So I like to put the variable in here and then say, now what variable value of that variable will make that answer? They start with the answer and say, because this works, that's the answer. Well, yeah, you knew that, but yeah, you wrote the book. But how do we figure it out? You know, so that's what I do. And I don't know, that to me is just circular. And I don't... If you knew the answer already, why? Oh, never mind. Okay, in the next one, they do the same thing. I would say, because sine of theta is equal to, or alpha, or whatever you want to call it, is equal to uh, square root of 3 over 2. Well, what angle gives you that? Well, pi thirds gives you that. So, that's your answer. Theta is equal to pi half, pi thirds. Okay? But say, they say, because this is true, that's the answer. Okay? Yeah, okay. But... They don't say how to get that as the answer. And then C was it is not possible to evaluate Y is equal to inverse sine of X with X equal 2 because there is no angle whose sine is 2. Sine is always between minus 1 and 1. So our, my not possible, that was their answer too. Remember the domain of the inverse sine function is minus 1 to 1. 2 is not in there. So you can't possibly have an inverse sign equal to. All right. Here's example two. Now example two is also, you can go to larsonprecalculus.com for an interactive version of this type of an example. Okay. It says sketch a graph of y is equal to arc cosine, I mean arc sine of x. Okay. Now, they've already done this for you just a little bit ago. Uh, but we can still do it if you want to. And again, I think what I would do is guess what? Rewrite this equation to read what? Say again. X equal. Not arc sine. Sine of y. Now, whereas before, I would usually say, give me an x and we'll calculate the y. This time, I'm going to say, give me a y and calculate the x. Now, before I do that, though, let's set up our scale here. What do you think the x values will take on? Especially when you look at it in this form. Where is that going from and to? What does sine range from? Negative 1 to 1. Okay? Got that part. Now, what will your y's have to be? Second? Okay, one more time. Oh, oh uh, I just messed up. Wait a minute. Sorry. Okay. I really messed up there. The X's, I think that's what I was asking, they go from negative 1 to 1. Because it's X that goes to negative 1 to 1. And what do the Y's go from? You may have said it before, but... Uh, Say again? I can't hear. No, no. That's what your x's are, because sine of something always stays between plus or minus 1. What do your y's go between? What y will give you, say, an x of 1? Sine of what angle would give you 1? Okay, it goes from negative pi halves to pi halves. Okay, that's where your Y's are going from. Okay? Now, 
Give me a value, any value, for y that you know the x for. Sine of y. Because remember, your y's are your angles here. And your x's are your values. That's why they're going from minus 1 to 1. Your y's are going from minus pi halves to pi halves. Give me a real easy y. Huh? Okay, a y of pi thirds. Okay, what would the x be then? Pi thirds would be somewhere up about here, I think. What would your x be? Second? A little louder? I can't hear. 30%? Is that what you said? We don't use percents when we're calculating signs, do we? What's the value? I just had that thing over there. Okay. Now, 45 is another angle. That goes on the y-axis. That would be right around there. But we're using... Ah, very good. Square root of 3 over 2 which is fairly close to 1. So I'm going to put it out here close to 1, okay? Remember, we got things backwards. Your y, which is your input, is on the vertical, and your x is your output, which is on the horizontal. So I put it sort of out there. I hope I'm pretty close. Now, another angle, you said 45, but I assume you meant by that pi force, didn't you? Okay, what is its value? Okay, root 2 over 2, which I'm pretty sure is going to be 0. 0.717. So that's still out here better than 1 half, right? Okay, so that one's there. Okay, got another one. This would be it. Pi force. Y'all like the hard ones, don't you? The others have to be easier than this. Give me another y. One of our favorites, please. Y'all leave off the easy, easy, easiest. Five over four. Five over four, we just did. Root two over two. Point seven one seven. Pi six. Pi six, okay, that's a little easier. That'll be down here. These aren't spaced evenly, but this will be pi 6. And what is the value? When y is equal to pi 6, what's your x? 1 half. So this one down here is just at 1 half here. Okay? Easy, easy, easy. Give me a y. I mean, a, yeah, a y. Zero! Okay. Oh, it worked way too hard. What's the sign of zero? Zero. Oh, man, the easiest thing going. And almost as easy as that would be sign of pi halves. There it is up there. You're just ignoring it. What's sign of pi halves? It's what? One. Of course it is. So that would be up here. So mine is a... I don't have that in quite the right place. It's probably out here somewhere. So this is a curve that goes like this. And and I, I don't have it spaced properly here. And this one does the same thing coming down this way. Remember, like I said, whereas the sine function is flat, uh, diagonal flat, this is steep, diagonal steep. Okay? So this should be pretty close to a diagonal, but I don't have my scale to quite go on right. That's what the inverse sine looks like. Um, so, again, to me, the sine function flat at pi halves, okay, and this at pi halves is just upon the, the x-axis. You flip it like this, 
flipping like this, then this would be flat, diagonal, flat. Okay? So this is steep, diagonal, steep. Okay? Just sort of think of it in that way. All right. Let me clear this out of the way. And let's see how they describe it. Maybe they do a lot better job than I do. Okay? By definition, the equation y is equal to arc sine x and sine of y is equal to x. See what they did? Same thing y'all did to get it started. Or equivalent for negative pi halves. Y is between negative pi halves and pi halves. All that sneezing I was doing now. Open the faucet. Okay? So the graphs are the same. And that is true. Uh, it's just that here you treat y as the independent variable, x is the dependent, but they're still at the same locations. So from the interval, negative pi halves to pi halves, they chose these as our values. They didn't choose negative pi thirds or positive pi thirds. Don't know why. If they weren't going to choose that one, I wouldn't have chosen pi fourths negative. Well, you do know this one. That's point seven eight, negative point seven eight seven eight positive. I just don't know what root 3 over 2 is because I don't know what root 3 is. Root 2 is 1.414. Divide that by 2 and you get 0 0.717. Okay. So I know what that one So Maybe that's what they chose. Do you know this is negative 1? That's negative 1 half. Positive 1 is 0. Positive 1 half 1. And this is 0 0.707 and negative 0.707. Okay. About 0.7. Okay. So from those, Put them on the board, and that's what you got. At y is negative pi half, you're at negative 1 for x. Um, this one, y is equal to negative pi fourths. This is at 0 0.707. Okay, out here. This is negative pi six. This is 1 half. Okay, so there are your values. This is about 0.707. Zero, zero. So one half. Pi six this way, one half this way. Pi four this way, exactly in between these two, you're at point seven this way. So you're closer over here. And here you're at pi halves, you're at one. So again, get it close to diagonal in the middle. Steep, diagonal, steep. Okay. That's how I remember as opposed to the sine function, which is flat, diagonal, flat. Okay? And those are mirror images of each other. Does that make sense? You don't have to remember it the way I do, but that's what helps me. Okay. Any questions on that? All right. Note that the reflection, it is a reflection across, across the line, y is equal x, of the black portion of this. Well, why didn't you draw it on the same map? on the same graph so you can see that. But you see, this is what I mean by flat, diagonal, flat. It would be steep, diagonal, steep. Okay? Its domain is just, this is negative pi halves to pi halves. It would be negative one to one. And its range uh, would be negative pi halves to pi halves. And this range is negative. Now, here is, I don't know where it is. Okay, remember that the domain of y is equal arc sine of x is the closed interval minus 1 to 1. The range is the closed interval minus pi halves to pi halves. Well, there was the figure that they were referring to. This is all you draw. Don't include anything here. That's not a function. And that's why when you do the sine function, like you did here, they really shouldn't include this because that's not one to one. This is not one to one. So they should have just drawn that whole graph. But they put it in black, so I guess that's the book. By the way, there is a checkpoint. Please do the checkpoints. Okay. Now we move to the other inverse trigonometric functions. 
what you reckon the first one of these is? Cosine. cosine. Okay. We'll do inverse cosine. But let's first do the cosine function. So you're right. Uh, the cosine function is decreasing. Well, you could have chosen over here and chosen an increasing function, or over here and choosing a decreasing function. You can't go negative pi halves to pi halves. Why? Why couldn't you choose just like you did sine? That's not one to one. Yeah, it's an even function. It's not one to one. So you have to choose a place where it's one to one. Where it's one to one here, so there you're a negative number. So let's just say positive and put them over here. From zero to pi. You go all the values from plus one to minus one here that it can take on. You can't go any beyond that because it turns up no longer one to one. Or here it turns down, no longer one to one. So you're limited between zero and pi. Okay? So that is the only portion of your cosine function that is one to one. That's the portion you choose. So that portion does have an inverse. This portion does not. That portion does not. You know, this portion does. This portion would too, but those are negative. We'll choose that. Okay. Consequently, on that interval, the cosine function has an inverse function. Why? Because cosine is 1 to 1 here, passes the horizontal line test, strictly decreasing here. That's another requirement. Uh, so, that's strictly decreasing, another term for it is monotonic, meaning when the x is increasing, y is either increasing or decreasing only. This is decreasing. Uh, so the inverse cosine function is denoted by y is equal to arc cosine x or y is equal to inverse cosine x. Now how is it going to look? Now this one is a, a bit weirder to me than the sine. Okay? And the reason is here your x's are always positive but your y's start positive and go negative. So that means on the inverse cosine, the y's have to be strictly positive, and the x's uh, start positive and... No, I did it wrong. I always do it wrong. It's something... like that, okay? Is that right? Yeah, I think it is. Okay. Because this is a decreasing function, this one has to be decreasing. Whereas this is flat, near diagonal flat, this has to be, uh, and that's an anti-diagonal, this has to be steep, anti-diagonal, steep, okay? It's only going to 1, which is out here about, about here, okay? Because this would be 3 halves, that would be 3. So, no, I'm sorry. No wonder this wasn't looking right. Let me erase that again. I was getting way too big. Pi halves is, three, is about 3 halves, so that's outside. I need to get my pen back. Okay, so here would be where the, uh, okay, this would be about where 1 was, okay, and this would be about where negative 1 would be, okay, because you flip your axes, remember, and then this one goes up here from 3 halves, so this will be that, that's how it looks. Something like that. Okay? Strictly decreasing, just like that, strictly decreasing, but it's flipped around. And that's still not right. I have the biggest trouble drawing these. We'll let them do it. Okay? Uh, far better if you write it down, so. 
I didn't write it down. Okay. Consequent on this invert. Okay. So, let's do it. Similarly, you can divide the invert. Ooh. They didn't even draw an inverse cosine. Okay. They do in the book. That's where I messed up. Because here, the X's are positive and the Y's, yeah, I did it wrong. This is how it's supposed to be. That, no, that's not it either. Because they don't coincide there. Um, You, uh, wait. All right. We'll get to it. I thought they were going to draw it, and they didn't. Okay? They go on to inverse tangent. So let's do... Well, there they draw it. Okay. Here's the inverse cosine. Now, if you remember the cosine function starts here that's where I was messing up it starts here and goes down yeah it starts here and goes down to there okay. go back and see the cosine function again whoops there it is starts there and goes down to there yeah okay so the inverse cosine, the cosine starts here and goes down to there. Then this reflects across there. This is hard to see. Sine, you stay between the same. Oh, yeah. You go through the origin. That's what makes it easy. The cosine does it. The cosine is strictly positive here, so it has to be strictly positive here. The inverse cosine has to be here. Yeah. Because across the x-axis, the cosine function, so it has to cross the y-axis here, but it has to be decreasing. I wish they'd show it on the same scale, they, on the same axes. They don't. Okay. But you can imagine it. So let's go back. Okay. Similarly, you can define the inverse tangent function by restricting the domain. Now, I wish they had shown the tangent function here. They didn't. So let's us go back and show the tangent function. I'll use this graph because it's set up right for us. Remember, the tangent function has vertical asymptotes at minus pi halves to pi halves. Okay? It's zero here. One at the quarter pies, and then approaches like this. Okay? Now, to do the inverse tangent function, this is, this is tangent x. Okay? The inverse tangent function would then do this. I'll go back to black. It would have horizontal asymptotes at pi halves and minus phi halves, and it would do, it also would pass through the origin, almost diagonal here. Oh, I should be in black, sorry. I thought I changed it. It didn't take, that's why it didn't. Okay, it would be like this. Okay, again, flipped across the, uh, got too many lines in there, so it makes it really ugly. This one out. Okay. Okay. So that's what the inverse tangent does. The tangent function, the only place it's one to one is between minus pi halves and pi halves. However, it is not equal to minus pi half or pi half. Sign was tangent is. Okay? So therefore your inverse function can't touch. Minus pi halves here, plus the pi halves there as part of your range, but it takes on infinite value 
absolutely negative, definitely positive. Just like this, the range here is definitely negative, but absolutely positive. Here, the domain is definitely negative, but absolutely positive. The range is between one and five halves and five halves, but it cannot touch those horizontal asymptotes. So that's why the there. So the following list summarizes the definitions of the three most common inverse trig functions. Thank you so much. They even left off cotangent. If you thought I had a hard time with cosine, you should see me try to do cotangent. That's pretty messy too. So similarly, you can divide the inverse tangent functions as this. So the following list summarizes the definitions of the two most common inverse trigonometric functions. Inverse sine, inverse cosine, inverse tangent. If you pull up your calculator, you'll see those three are on there. You don't see inverse cosine, cotangent, you don't see inverse cosecant, and you don't see inverse secant. These are the, about the only three we ever use that way. So, the function of y is equal to arc sine x, if and only if sine of y is equal to x. Just like we said before, um, in this case, your x is your value, not your angle, because that's the value, it's between negative 1 and 1, so the x is restricted between negative 1 and 1, but does include negative 1 and 1. The range here, uh, which is your angle, the y, the y, the angle, that's between negative pi halves and negative and pi halves, and it does include those points. Arc cosine, if and only if cosine y is equal to x, y can only go from um, 0 to pi. Okay? So therefore, that becomes your range. Okay? Your domain is from 1 to negative 1. Because cosine is negative, uh, it's decreasing function in there, so it's from 0 to pi. X is going from plus or minus 1, inclusive, and the Y is going from 0 to pi, inclusive. And the arc tangent is if and only if tangent of Y is equal to X. That means Y can only be from minus pi halves to pi halves, not including the endpoints, not including the vertical asymptote. Okay? So, uh, Except now they're horizontal asymptotes because it's the values for y. But now the x, because the tangent of y can be anywhere from negative infinity to positive infinity, that makes the domain of the inverse tangent all real numbers. Your range is between minus pi halves and pi halves. That one's pretty easy to show, too. Just keep that in mind. The cosine's the one that drives me nuts. And cotangent if they did that. So here's the y is equal to arc cosine. Now let me try again to get the cosine function here. The cosine function would start here at 1. Which would maybe be a bit somewhere about there. And at pi halves, which would be somewhere around here, it would go to 0. And down here at negative 1, it would go to Again, I'm going nuts on this. Uh, It would go to negative 1 down here, which would be somewhere about here. Okay. So it would do something like... Okay. That's not a very good rendition of it. But let's see... Okay, 
those are supposed to be inverse functions of each other. Uh, and again, my drawing really stinks. Uh, I probably should have done different colors for them too. But where this is doing that, this one's doing that. So they they look like they kind of show. I, I wish they showed them on the same scale. They don't. This one, you can imagine that like this or that like that, and you can imagine this one like that. You know, just just a vertical asymptote flip them over. This one just looks differently. Okay. Don't beat yourself to death over it. All right. So example three: find the exact value of these. How are we doing on time? Time's up. How can it be? Okay, we'll start next time with example three. Then. Sorry about that. I wasted too much time telling stories and um, then messing with inverse cosines. They always drive me nuts. Homework exercises here would include five, seven, Eleven and fifteen and seventeen. They're all at Calc Chat. Five's at Calc View. Uh, Nineteen should be at Calc Chat. Twenty-one, twenty-three, they should all be at Calc Chat. 21 should be at Calc View. 37, I think you can do. Thirty-nine through forty-three, I think you can do too. Uh, they're all at Calc Chat. Thirty-nine's at Calc View. And stop there. We'll pick up the rest of those later. Good deal. All right, and you have a test you can be working on. Some of you, some of you, turn that in. Try to get this in before we finish 4.8. Hopefully, we'll finish 4.7 next time and get into 4.8. 4.8 uh, is not all that long, so we should be through it fairly easily. I uh, don't believe there's a fourth no. 4.8 ends the chapter, so we'll end there. Good deal. Any questions? Less. One other thing, have a good weekend. Maybe a soggy weekend, but have a good one if you can. Okay. Seems like it has been nothing but soggy so far. I don't want that. I don't want this.